My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee and we have a few pickup trucks in the trailer. One day, we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona. This is on the Navajo Reservation, about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he's chilling with his Navajo friend Travis and his girlfriend. Now Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock and he hasn't seen them in ages. He suggests they go with him. I was six or seven at the time, and it was summertime. So dad decides we'll all go down together. He can do his delivery really quick while Travis visits with his family, and we can go check out the Window Rock. Window Rock is a big rock face with a large hole in it that goes to the other side. It's pretty cool. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in Window Rock. Everything is generally uneventful. And we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip, but this part, I can never forget. At this point, we're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway, there's nothing but sandstone cliffs. And on the right, there's a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill, and down at the bottom of the hill, we see what appears to be a very large dog sitting on its haunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs. My dad calls over the radio, hey Trav, do you see this big ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio. That's not a dog, man. Speed up right now and hit it. He's almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming. Hit it! You have to hit it, please, please! So my dad starts to speed up and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see it a little more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs. But the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us and it has a face. I don't know how else to describe it, other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realize it's actually enormous. Though it was still sitting on its haunches, it was about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get inches from hitting it. When it lets out this scream that sounds like someone as their lungs were filling with water, and then it leaps backwards toward the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again. Holy shit, keep driving. We have to get out of here. Keep going. We have to go faster. He kept repeating that last part. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. Pretty soon, we're speeding like crazy. And just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge. He immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. And Travis says, We just saw a skinwalker a few miles back, and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car, and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. I was a kid when this happened. My uncle and I were finishing up chopping and gathering firewood for my grandmother because it was getting dark. Driving back on a dirt road about 30 miles an hour, I had this 
awful sense of being watched. Before I could turn to look out my window, my uncle quickly shouted, Don't. Don't. I completely froze. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest. Then completely stopped when I heard a tap, tap, tap on my window. My uncle sped up and was loudly praying in my native language. I didn't know what was going on, and I, and I thought it was over till our truck suddenly dipped from the bed. My uncle started saying, Look at me. Don't turn away. Look at me. Don't turn away. Over and over. And then I heard it again. But from the window behind me, and it was getting harder for me to breathe, and I wanted to cry. A minute or two passed and the truck dipped again. My uncle looked around and sighed, and it was quiet besides the truck and the road. He looked at me and said, We will ask your father to do a prayer in the morning, so the evil will forget our faces. I remember curling up on the seat and just staring at the radio watching time, listening to my uncle sing an old prayer until we got to my grandmother's house. I called my uncle because I had a nightmare about that night. We talked about it for a bit and he said, I didn't see faces, just eyes, like brake lights you see on the road. It watched you. Before hanging up, I tried joking with him about it. Why didn't you just step on the brake when it was in the back? No laughter. He just paused and said, because it wasn't alone. Anybody that has been on the Navajo reservation has either probably heard of some creepy things or have experienced creepy things. Namely, skinwalkers. I've only seen one, and here's my story. I come from a small town in northern Arizona that's sandwiched between the Paiute Reservation and the north and the U.S.'s largest Navajo reservation to the south. My school is so small that there's around 80 students enrolled every year. Always had to travel to the south about 5 to 10 hours one way to play another high school in any sport. This means we traveled a lot on the Navajo reservation. And we also usually stayed at hotels when we would head out to play and come home in the morning. But this trip was a little bit different. I remember the basketball coach saying that the school didn't even have enough money to put up the teams in a hotel. So we were going to be on the road for a total of about 12 hours. I was the only male senior to play basketball that season. We had just got done playing our game and heading home on our bus. We called it Big Blue. We were headed out and it wasn't long before we entered the res. By this time, everyone was asleep with it being about 2 o'clock in the morning. When we had crossed the res's border, I noticed the bus driver sped up and was now going about 85 miles per hour. I thought this was a little weird because we never exceeded the speed limit. At least not in my high school career. For some reason, I couldn't fall back asleep like the rest of my teammates. I just sat at the back of the bus, staring out across the desolate desert landscape that was lit up by the full moon. As I looked out, I could see a figure running toward the school bus at an angle of pursuit, and it kept up with the bus at 85 miles an hour. As the figure got closer, I saw that it was a humanoid form. As a matter of fact, it looked exactly like a human, only that the face was painted half black and half white with glowing eyes. Glowing eyes like a rabbit's eyes reflecting from a spotlight. And I immediately thought, holy crap, it's a skinwalker. The skinwalker ran up to the edge of the road and just kept up pace with the bus, hurtling sagebrush and rocks while staring directly at me. After I made eye contact with the thing, I could not look away. It was as if something was holding my head and my eyes in place. The skinwalker just smiled at me, this inhuman smile that went ear to ear, showing crooked yellow pointed teeth. I felt like I was going to throw up. I was panicking through the entire ordeal. The skinwalker started to crumple down onto all fours, still keeping up with the bus. I could see his bones crack and reform. Hair started appearing all over the skinwalker's body, and in about three seconds, it was now a coyote and ran back off into the desert out of view. As soon as it was gone, I ran to the onboard bathroom 
and puked a mixture of food and blood. I didn't want to tell anyone for fear they would think I was crazy. I confided in my Navajo friend. She told me that I needed to see the chief, who also happened to be a friend of mine, and get a blessing. I saw him at school the next day in the parking lot. He just came up to me and mumbled something in Navajo while waving a feathered skeptor-like thing. Turned around, got in his truck, and drove away. To this day, I haven't seen another skinwalker. It might be due to the fact that I moved away from that town and Rez. And if I do have to go south, I go around. Way around. This all happened about five years ago. One night, a few of my friends decided after a night of hanging out that we should go on an adventure at 3 o'clock in the morning. We took a ride about 50 miles to this old Spanish ruin in New Mexico that was once the seat of Inquisition. I can't for the life of me remember what the place is called. So we jumped the front gate of the place and started exploring. One of my friends brought a flute with him and he started playing it. 30 seconds into his mediocre playing, something started screaming really, really loud on the tops of the long destroyed walls of the place. It was going from wall to wall, screaming the most blood-curdling scream you can imagine. We get out of there. One of my friends even peed his pants and drove for a few hours to Bandelier National Monument, where we had already planned to camp out for the rest of the weekend. We got to Bandelier at probably 6 or 7 a.m. and set up our camp. After a few hours just talking about what happened at the ruins, I went to take a piss that was probably about 300 feet from our camp. This is where everything starts getting a little fuzzy. I remember seeing two dust devils coming my way. And when I turned around again, two of my friends were there, and they were motioning me to just follow them. I couldn't help but to follow them, like I was being pulled behind them in shackles. I followed them for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes, and then I snapped out of it. These weren't my friends. They had bright red hair with my friends' faces and cat eyes. Both of these friends were brunette. I stopped walking and they looked at me with probably the most terrifying gaze I've ever seen. Monsters in movies are nothing compared to this. I turned around and ran as fast as I could back the way I came from. After five minutes of a full sprint, after about five minutes of a full sprint, I got back to the tree that I pissed at and found our camp. Everyone was still there, still sitting around talking and didn't even notice that I was gone. I told them what had happened with a look-alike skinwalkers. We packed up everything and left within 10 minutes. We live in a rural community on the Navajo reservation. My aunts and her two brothers were home alone while my grandparents had left for the evening to attend a chapter house meeting. They were in the house and like many other from the reservation, didn't have electricity. It had been dark outside for about an hour. My aunt and my uncles were getting ready for bed. Outside, they heard noises, as if someone was moving things around outside. My oldest uncle went to look out the front window and saw a figure out by the truck. This was immensely out of the ordinary because the closest neighbor was miles away. Whatever it was opened the truck door and began to dig through the personal items that my family had left in that vehicle. My aunt and uncles were frightened by this sight and knew that they should take action. They took out the rifle and all studied themselves to hold it up. They flung open the door and aimed the gun at the dark figure. The figure turned and started to walk toward them, totally unfazed by the weapon. My uncle pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The figure drew closer, and my aunt began to smell something like a rotting corpse. It was so strong, it made her gag. My uncle continued to pull the trigger with no luck, and the figure came closer and closer. Off in the distance, headlights were coming up the road, 
My grandparents were returning. The figure looked toward the lights and started to move away and tucked itself behind a tree near the house. My oldest uncle ran toward the truck with the gun. My grandfather got out of the car and my uncle pointed to the tree. The thing was poking out its head to observe what they were doing. My grandfather ran into the house and over to the stove and grabbed a handful of ashes and rubbed it over the gun and placed an ash-covered bullet into the chamber. He walked out onto the porch and fired toward the tree. Whatever that thing was, didn't expect the gun to go off. The gunshot echoed and the dark figure began running. My grandma chased my aunt inside and my uncles and my grandfather went after it. There weren't many roads or paths so as my grandfather and uncles chased after the figure, the truck was bouncing and the headlights were not fixed on one particular spot. My uncle swears that whenever the headlights would hit the figure, he saw a woman. Not only that, whoever it was, was running on all fours like a bear. My grandfather eventually stopped the truck, and as they neared the ditch that drops about 20 feet, he got out and began to yell in Navajo. My uncle says that he was yelling about a local woman. He yelled that he wasn't scared and that he knew it was her and to leave his family alone. A few days passed and there was news that the woman that my grandfather was yelling about passed away. I've always been told that if you know who the skinwalker is, say their name and it will kill them. While trading stories around a campfire, my friend recalled an encounter he had while serving an LDS mission. My friend's mission region had a reservation within its boundaries. However, it was relatively far from where he was serving. On one occasion, he and his mission companion were asked to travel further than usual to meet with some investigators. This took them near the reservation. On their way home, their car ran out of gas and it wasn't until late at night that they were able to continue the journey home. My friend, who was driving while his companion slept in the passenger seat, chose a different route that took him through some back roads in an attempt to get home sooner. He told us he was driving above the speed limit when he noticed movement in the woods lining the road. Because coyotes were common in the area, he took little notice at first. Then he looked out the window and slammed on the brakes. The sudden stop jolted his companion awake, who immediately wanted to know what was wrong. My friend was shaken and said he would tell him once they got home. He asked him to say a prayer. By the time they made it home, his companion was dying to know what had happened. My friend told him, I looked down at the road next to the car and saw six men running on all fours, keeping up with the car. I was driving 40 miles an hour. This is my father's story, written from his perspective. When I was 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone, a lot like our house now. It was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to a feast and left us to tend to the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs outside going crazy, thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance. We told them to be quiet. We began to drift off into sleep, and the dogs would not shut up. Somehow I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house, except for my brothers snoring and breathing. I realized I needed to use the outhouse and woke my brother to take me out there. He teased me about being scared. I certainly was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs began with their crazed barking and the sagebrush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first and I waited for him outside. While waiting, I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight and suddenly, there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Then everything 
went quiet. It was too quiet for that time of year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I heard one of the dogs go completely mad by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab of the roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little while, and then suddenly kicking one of them. They all scattered in different directions. The thing looked up at me, and I saw its face. It had a pure white face, like a full moon with burning red eyes and a slight smile that was pure black. I couldn't move or make a sound. It began to walk toward me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was dark red, like the color of the blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of the outhouse, and with this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted to buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed this thing's long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in the summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move toward my brother, finally noticing this figure. My brother became paralyzed, just as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out toward my brother's head. Something finally snapped in me. I became unbearably angry. I broke from the trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became angrier at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. And finally, with everything I had, I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backward and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull, its smile now gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the feast. After relaying the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man. Whenever my mom would take us on a road trip to her hometown on the Navajo Reservation, I'd occasionally ask her to tell me a skinwalker story along the way. I remember every story she told me as we were driving through the miles of nothing at night. Luckily, nothing ever happened to us driving those drives. This is one of those stories, and it came from my auntie. My auntie and some of her friends used to party a lot back in the day. They'd hop in a beaten down van, drive out to the boondocks, and just drink and have fun. Of course, this all took place on the Navajo reservation after sunset. And on this particular night, that's what they were doing. Everything was going good. When all of a sudden, they hear what sounds like rocks being thrown at their van. Everyone gets quiet as they wonder what the hell's going on. The sounds of rocks being thrown stops and then suddenly something jumps on top of the van roof. I should mention my family owned a white van that we used for road trips because it had enough room for all of my brothers and me. So imagine young me being told the story in that van terrifying. Everyone starts panicking as the realization sets in and hurry to lock all the doors. My auntie jumps in the driver's seat and tries to start the engine. Of course, the beaten down van then refuses to start. Whatever is on the roof is still up there, making banging noises. At this point, like it's jumping up and down, my aunt is freaking out when she then sees a hand with long nails 
reach over the roof and start scratching the windshield. At this point in the story, my mom would take one hand off the steering wheel and scratch the windshield to simulate it. Then whatever was on the roof jumps off. Everyone is still freaking out, yelling at my aunt to start the van and she keeps trying. That's when she sees the skinwalker walk up to the driver's side window and stare at her just a few inches away. That's when my aunt jumped in the back and started praying for her life. Minutes pass and the skinwalker appears to leave. My aunt hops back in the driver's seat, gets the van to start, and they drive away. I was told this story once. My dad isn't a bullshitter or a liar, so I know the story is true. This was the very early 80s, and my sister who lived in Toronto came down to visit our parents for a weekend. She was staying at a friend's house who loaned her a car so she could come out. After her visit, she left a little after 9 p.m. She got maybe seven or eight miles away when the car broke down. Thankfully, she broke down in front of a friend at a family's house. They let her in to call dad and dad came to get her. The family said she could leave the car there in their driveway for the night. And my sister decided to just stay at my parents for the night. It was now a little after 10. Pitch black. It's late November. My sister and dad are driving back to the house and they pass through a heavily wooded area. Out of nowhere, they hear this incredibly loud, inhuman scream. The scream was heard over the engine, their conversation, and the radio. Dad slammed on the brakes, and they both start freaking out. When a suddenly six-foot-tall coyote walking on two legs with a black and white striped tail appeared on the side of the road and proceeded to walk in front of the car. As soon as it passed, that same scream came again and again, only this time it was ten times louder. My dad slammed on the accelerator and they got the hell out of there and they never saw it again. My roommate has told me the story a few times and I want to see if anyone else has had similar experiences. As he tells it, he was driving home super late at night, around 3 or 4 a.m., in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. Both times that this occurred. The first time, he was driving alone on a road that had an open field to the left of it, when out of nowhere, a black figure on all fours bounds up to the field and across the road in front of his car. As soon as the figure got to the other side of the road, it stops with inhuman quickness, turns around, and looks directly at my roommate. He described the figure as looking simian, completely black except for the face. The creature's face was stark human white. Not white as in Caucasian, but white like snow. This happened again a few weeks later, but this time the creature was sitting in a tree. As his car approached, it climbed down the tree, again with inhuman quickness, bounded across the street, stopped on a dime, turned around, and made eye contact with him again. This time he had a friend in the car who also saw it and began freaking out. It was the same exact thing as the first time. Simeon, black body, with a snow white expressionless human face. My roommate, the ever curious one, turned the car around and began searching for the creature. But it was nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. 
For many people familiar with these creatures, saying out loud what they are can be just as frightening as seeing one face to face. They say when you talk about them, it draws their attention to you. So here I sit with a supernatural target on my back. But I'm not so sure you're safe as a listener, as I have no idea if a skinwalker knows the difference between your voice or mine. If you have a story you'd like to see featured here, please email me at duchessdark676 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching. See you next time.